one area has surprisingly not been mentioned at all, and I'd like to start Kui, with you and get the uh, comments, and that is uh, China's decision to militarize coral reefs, creating really militarized uh, zones for your jet fighters, then under the <coughs> extended economic zone, claim, claiming that your sovereignty extends hundreds of nautical miles beyond that, and then up with your airspace, ignoring a decision by the uh, court under the law of the sea that the Philippines brought. Uh, how do you justify that kind of provocation? And how, did you, how would you expect others to react? I mean, the US, I know I was on the Defense Policy Board. With Obama, we recommended, and he did, and Mr. Trump has continued it, to have our warships go by that to make it clear we believe it's international waters. So how do you justify this? It seems to me a highly provocative right. action. Could you pass the microphone right, right behind you? Yes, thank you. Yeah, Tatsumasa from Japan. I have a burning question to Aoi-san and Mr. Kim. Donald Trump allowed uh, North Korea to test short to mid-range missiles, which are very difficult to even intercept by Aegis or Pac-3. So exposing to the threat, increasingly neighbors like Japan and South Korea. The point is, is Japanese government taking some actions vis-a-vis -vis United States or just holding breath? <laughs> and same question to Mr. Kim about Korean government. Thank okay, you. great, thanks. And then this gentleman in the front row, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Yoichi Suzuki from uh, Japan, like Ambassador Kim, I spent many years in the Japanese diplomacy, not necessarily in the field of security. Uh, and like him, I uh, stepped aside on the sideline recently. Um, my intention is not to get into uh, some sort of debate with Ambassador Kim, but uh, I would make a few um, observations on bi uh, bilateral relationship. I would, uh, using his uh, expression, uh, qualify that uh, we're not on the edge of a uh, divorce, but uh, certainly our marriage had a bumpy <laughs> <laughs> stages. And uh, it's another bumpy, sort of tense period, but uh, uh, I think there's a bit of a uh, difference in perception between Japan and Korea on this issue, and I think it's not that bad. But I would at the same time say that uh, in spite of a fairly close public sentiment, the relationship between our two leaders are quite difficult at this moment. And um, I think the point is that, as you said, Japan and South Korea, to a large extent, share common interest. And of course, I mean, even we can say we share, to a certain extent, common destiny, because we are under the same threat. Um, in the past, I think uh, we are two countries had the wisdom of somewhat even having a difficult relationship on historic issues, set this aside, somewhat separate this from the vital security issues. And this is, I think, exactly what the two leaders should be doing right now, uh, okay. to identify the longer term interest, common interest for both of us, and not sort of jeopardize uh, this uh, at the expense of uh, this, uh, what you qualify as, as uh, as a uh, retaliation, right. what Thank we you. we qualify as a normalizing the export control of some material used for semiconductor production because right, no, we know. suspect that these semiconductors produced in South Korea ends up in the hands of uh, people we not necessarily appreciate. All right. Thank you very, very much. And, and um, yeah. So, Sorry, no, no, I, mean, I have so a question. I have well, I mean, one question. So just say the question quickly then. Yeah. Um, some of you have referred to uh, the, the Donald Trump uh, and Kim Jong-un talking as a positive move. But I think this move actually, as some of you have, have alluded, lifted somewhat the pressure on North Korea on sanctions. So ask the question. Yes. Okay. So I'm saying, had Donald Trump not met Kim Jong-un and, and had this sort of easing of the sanction did not take place, would it have been more conducive to produce a better move, constructive move on the part of North Korea? 
which is an excellent question, but thank you. So we are almost, we are basically out of time. So I'm gonna ask you to come down the row, 30 seconds each, so okay. choot, choot, short. Um, and just, so there was a, actual question directed at you, Mr. Chow, so sure. why don't you I'm respond. going to address the question regarding the island in South China Sea. Uh, it's a big contribution. I, I, I'm not expert in this area. But uh, the basic fact is this island is not uh, some uh, territory of any uh, international recognized uh, sovereignty land. It, they are distributed. It's not yeah. peninsula of Crimea, okay? It's not part of that. So from Chinese perspective, they regard this island belong to China, part of that. So obviously from their perspective, they put some weapon for self-defense. I, I don't think it, it's a big deal, but you look at it, which country occupy most number of islands? Not China, other country. But why U.S. only targeting China? Right. That, that's the country. Also, U.S. so far have not approved, Congress not rectifies the, the law, United Nations sea law. Mm -hmm. How have that's a true. legitimate reason to so strongly against China? That's something very strange for me. Okay. It's it is something you and Mr. Eisenstadt might want to discuss more later, but let's, but let's go to Doug. Well, just to follow up on Stu's question, the, um, I've always assumed that China moved on the islands initially because other states that were claimants in the same area had similarly put some facilities, and China wanted to be sure it was left in the bargaining, not out of the bargaining. How it became so militarized is a separate question. Of course we were going to do freedom of navigation operations through that region with all parties. Um, when the Secretary of Defense asked me my advice, I said put in five comparable facilities at low cost with CBs on five Philippine controlled islands nearby so that the military effect would be nullified. And then do n launch a diplomatic initiative by running constant freedom of navigation exercises. The issue of response in China is left to the military sector, not to the diplomatic sector. Foreign ministry is frozen out, the military gets to call the shots. That should not be in our interest. We want to get the diplomats involved. My proposal would have been start serious negotiations on fisheries agreements in that region. They're being rapidly depleted. Everybody's got an interest in conservation of those, those uh, fish resources, and we could put it in the hands of some neutral parties to take the lead, but it would be a diplomatic way of getting at this issue without militarizing it. Thank you. Mr. Kim. Uh, North Korea's uh, launch of short-range ballistic missile is a clear violation of UN Security Council resolution. But Korea government didn't uh, condemn such launch because President Trump said it was just small missiles. Uh, and I don't think uh, the, the President Trump met with uh, Kim Jong-un was wrong. As I said earlier, the timing was wrong. There was strong international sanctions regime against North Korea. We should have allowed the time for these sanctions to take effect. Thank you. Ms. Aoi, last words. And, uh, yes, I think that the uh, most recent North Korean trials and errors with regard to short-range missiles and SLBM is certainly uh, provocative. And, uh, but I, I, my own view is that the deep set still deterrence still made on the Korea, Korean Peninsula, supported by superior conventional nuclear capability, uh, you know, uh, antagonizing side, um, might be uh, a little difficult to shake off. So I think that we all, all of these trials and errors will provide for maneuverability, certainly for the regime. I think that still deterrence still made, I think, will uh, stay for the time being. And it, I think it's very important also to think of uh, you know, US-Japan relations as needed, and also it's important to develop these relations. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's nothing to be ashamed of, it's very important. And also at the same time, um, Japan needs to build a, you know, a rules-based relations with China, as well as developing you know, partnerships broader than in the smaller region. So all these things matter. Those provide for a critical matrix. Great, thank you. So thank you to the panel. I wish we had more time. Um.
And this also gives me an excuse or a pretext before I, to thank Thierry, the organizers, all of you, your patience, the incredible Song Nim. I, I, you know, I think all of us understand the work that goes into this meeting. So let's give them a round of applause too.